my friend <coughs> Ray McGovern, in his writings, has uh, pleaded with, with CIA analysts, government workers, to come forth and be brave as you were. And I, my question to you is, uh, uh, Scott Ritter comes to mind, and he hasn't been given the coverage, the press, that you've been given. He's been marginalized still, even though he was right. In your opinion, are there any people that you would consider having anywhere near the courage uh, in protesting the Iraq war and having the information that maybe the public needed to, to um, have the outcry that we needed to have. First of all, you mentioned Scott Ritter, and I was, I'm glad you did. And I, I was pleased that the, uh, the marvelous review in the Washington Post today uh, quoted me on that. I, I pay tribute to Scott Ritter a lot. Uh, you know, the, again, the, Condi Rice, the president, everybody, were all saying, who could have imagined? We never imagined the possibility that they had no weapons. And actually, the CIA estimates, as far as we know, did not manage to manage, uh, imagine that. And Scott Ritter, the former inspector there, uh, not only imagined it, was saying that during the war. And has uh, gotten a lot of you know, heat throughout from that. Are there other people? I have no doubt that there are people there. First of all, that there are thousands of people in the Pentagon and CIA and State Department who believe uh, let's just say what Carl Eikenberry, the former Lieutenant General, retired, who is now our ambassador in Kabul, clearly asserted to the President uh, in cables that have now been released in the New York Times just a couple of weeks ago. And that was the first time I'd seen facsimile copies of, uh, of papers. It was on their internet release since the Pentagon Papers. I mean, they, they don't come to me routinely anymore. <laughs> and, the, uh, it, and, and they don't get printed in the papers. I noticed even the Times didn't have that startling, dramatic appearance. You know, the actual cables, they put it on the internet, which is, is fine anyway. What Eikenberry was saying, of course, was what I'm sure is widely, widely believed in the Pentagon. He didn't use the word hopeless. But that's the only inference you could take from it, as he said. We have none of the ingredients for any kind of success there. And all that will happen if the president sends a lot more troops there, as McChrystal, <coughs> his military counterpart, was asking, and he's sitting in Kabul, says, all that will happen if you, if you give his request, whether it's for 80,000 or 30,000, is, to paraphrase here, a long, bloody stalemate until we leave, leaving a lot of death behind and nothing else. OK, so I can barely see that. We now know. The other side of that is, and Matthew Ho, uh, who's under Eikenberry in a, in a uh, strongly Taliban-controlled province, in, uh, had the same conclusion at a lower level, a former Marine Company commander like me, but he'd been a company commander in wartime in Iraq, I was in peacetime. He was now a civilian like me in, a, in this war. And he resigned and came back and testified widely, though not to Congress, which didn't call him. Now, I thought at the time he should have been sitting at the table with McChrystal and Eikenberry when they testified, but they weren't, Congress wasn't demanding any testimony like that. They allowed Eikenberry to raise his right hand and say under oath, two weeks after he'd sent these cables, which are now leaked, I agree fully with McChrystal's recommendations. We are arm in arm on this. I agree with the president's program. Now, uh, let me just guess. <laughs> that that was a lie. A very, a very common standard kind of lie. Out of a hundred officials in his position who had sent those cables uh, and were now asked to testify uh, about the president's program, which he decided after the cables, ignoring them, about a hundred, after about a hundred, if they'd been asked to a hundred would have done what he did. Would have lied for the team, lied for his job, lied for the president. That's not just common, that's just close to universal except that Matthew Ho didn't do that. And if I may say, I didn't do that. And the person who leaked the cables didn't do that. Now I'm sure that there is a plumber's outfit in the White House right now, or the Pentagon, uh, working hard to find out who leaked those cables and neutralize them before they, before they strike again uh, and put out more truth. But I'll say now for an action that could be done right now, uh, the, this wonderful, uh, action that's going on by Robert Greenwald, Brave New Foundation, Brave New Films, very informative. They had uh, Matthew Ho come and uh, do films for them. And they're having a petition, which I sent out as far as it goes, uh, I agreed with it as far as it went, saying, tell your congressperson to read those cables before they vote the appropriations. 
But I wrote back and said, okay, that's all very well, but they have the cables now from the New York Times. What they need to do and what we here in this town need to do is to tell those Congress people on committees, bring Eikenberry back for testimony, allow him to clarify the discrepancy between his sworn testimony that the program is fine and his secret testimony to the president that it was hopeless, that it was useless, and give him a chance to tell the truth now and uh, inform us even further and be fired and then come out like Ho and speak even more widely. That's something we can do. We can tell Congress we want for the first time hearings. There have been no serious hearings on Afghanistan or <coughs> Iraq, or Iraq. Real hearings that don't just support the program. And bring this back, and it's not only Eikenberry that can get, have Ho testify at last, and have Ho told me He's gotten endless emails and messages from other people who say, in the Foreign Service, right on, of course we agree with you, right, just, you know, as in the movie, but uh, who uh, don't have any thought of doing the same. I actually think this film, if it's seen by the people in the system, and I don't know, I won't ask for hands if there are any here tonight, because <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'd be glad if you were, and I will not want you to identify yourselves at this point. Think of what you could do, though. I would like this film to be seen in the Pentagon and in CIA. And if anybody here knows a way of hacking it into the Pentagon, <laughs> or because I really think, in answer to the question, I really think there's a lot of people there who, of course, have the courage. Some of them have shown it on the battlefield. They have not thought of drawing on their courageous ability to risk their clearances or their jobs or to risk defying the president. Now, Eikenberry hasn't, but Eikenberry can change on this. And. Uh, uh, there was a time when uh, I was silent about this. There was a time when Ho was silent, but you can change. And it takes us to change that. And listen, before, we, we, there's going to be another film. I want to recognize two people who are in the film, who are here tonight. Uh, I hope. I, I know one of them is. Uh, you saw only her disembodied hand cutting top secret off the top and bottom of the papers when she was 10 years old. And that's my daughter, Mary. Who's in the <laughs> My one complaint to the directors was that Mary ended up on the cutting room floor along with all those top secret uh, kids that she, she got off. And the other one is a man who is in the film who was identified in various ways, but they left out three things. Uh, he's a Nobel Prize laureate uh, in economics, and this is Tom Schelling. And in an increasing order, uh, he was the one person, not the one, there were two or three people, including Mort Halpern from my old life who had clearances, who continued to speak to me and to be my friend and be supportive. And uh, it's Tom Schelling, is he, and he's my mentor who was the supervisor on my PhD thesis and decision. There are a lot of people that are whistleblowers, have blown their whistle, but because mainstream media won't yes. cover it, you don't know it. You don't know it. And so the Washington Post, the New York Times, are the leaders and the warmongers that have been leading the yes. mainstream media to war. And so we've got, during that time, we at least had a media that was interested in peace. We don't have that today. We have so, Amy Goodman. Well, but, but that's not mainstream media, not by a long shot. She's great, but that's not enough. And so we have a problem. We've got our hands tied behind our back. So fine, but that problem we'll eventually deal with. I don't know if the mainstream media, the Post and the Times, will be shamed by this film, but this film showed them in their heyday. They are not in their heyday. They're in the toilet today. Yeah. <laughs>